Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and I want to thank you for tuning in for a little bit of Texas history. Man, y'all really liked the last episode about the three Emmas. If you haven't heard that episode, I encourage everyone to go back and listen to it. It was a, It's just such a great story. There's a lot of holes in that story, and uh, often it raises more questions than answers. But I'd love if any of the listeners who've heard that episode have any insight into that case from San Antonio in the early 1900s. I'd love to hear from you about it. I've gotten some great feedback on the story and a few details that I didn't know, but I think it'd be uh, great if you go back and listen to that and check it out. It's a fun story. Well, it's revolution time in Texas. You know, in Texas, we consider the springtime, the anniversary of the events of the Texas Revolution, culminating with the Battle of San Jacinto in April, as the Texas High Holy Day. So we're in that time period, and there is no way you can write or talk about Texas history during this time without referring to the events of the revolution. So we are definitely going to talk a little bit about uh, the revolution. I titled this episode, Revolutionary Texas Governments and Organizing Chaos. And what I want to do uh, today is look at some of the governments uh, or governing bodies that formed during the time period of the Texas Revolution, because the most common stories that we talk about on these anniversaries are the Battle of the Alamo, the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, the Runaway Scrape. I think uh, a very underrated battle in importance was the Siege of Behar, which I covered in the first few episodes of this podcast. But one thing that we don't talk about is what was happening on the home front. Now, there wasn't really a home front back then when you're dealing with a revolution, especially in a place like 1830s Texas. There wasn't a, really a home front. You were on the front lines no matter where you were. But I think that it's important to look at what was happening behind the scenes because not only was there a military revolution being fought, but... The Texans were trying to organize into some sort of governing body so that the business of the soon-to-be-declared independent republic can be conducted in an orderly fashion. And most importantly, and this was really an overriding issue during the entire period of Revolutionary Texas, how are we going to pay for all this stuff? So there was a lot of activity that that, uh, was governmental in nature, and I think that's what I want to talk about today. So let's go back to about 1824 and get wise about Texas. Well, recall in 1821 that Mexico won her independence from Spain. In 1824, uh, there was a Federalist Revolution led by our old friend Santa Ana. They formed a constitution, the Mexican Constitution of 1824, and we've talked about that on this program before The Constitution was a Federalist Constitution like the United States Constitution. Uh, If you read the Mexican Constitution of 1824, parts of it will look very familiar. And it was during this time that Stephen F. Austin was starting his colony in Texas. Uh, The terms under which Austin was granted his colony essentially were that his colonists needed to become Mexican citizens, become Catholic, and learn to speak Spanish. So Austin's vision was to bring these colonists in under the Mexican Constitution of 1824 and a federalist system that would have been familiar to the new immigrants from the United States. Well, the colonists came, as we know, starting with the old 300. And think for a minute about what these people were doing. They were not just moving on to vacant land. They were leaving the United States and moving to a foreign country. And they were leaving the stable, uh, relatively prosperous uh, governmental structure of the United States for the farthest flung outer province of a strange nation. And what they would not abandon, of course, is their American values and their notions of freedom and all of the systems and, and structures under which they had grown up. So you can foresee some tension if you moved from the United States or wherever, whatever country you live in. This podcast is being downloaded in over 40 countries. 
and you move to a different country with a different system of laws, it would be quite the adjustment. And tensions began almost immediately. In late 1826 and early 1827, there was an incident, and we're going to cover this in another episode in detail, but it was called the Fredonian Rebellion. And it happened in Nacogdoches, and there were some uh, settlers that rebelled against the Mexican authorities. And, of course, in Mexico City and in the capital of Coahuila y Tejas, uh, th- the government officials began to get a little nervous about these new immigrants. In 1828... Uh, the president of Mexico, Bustamante, sent General Manuel Mier y Terran. And once again, I apologize to everyone for butchering the Spanish pronunciations, um, but I took French in high school, not Spanish, so we'll do the best we can. Anyway, General Terran was uh, sent to Texas to try and assess the situation. Here's what General Terran found, and I'm going to read from part of his report. Quote, The whole population here is a mixture of strange and incoherent parts without parallel in our federation. Numerous tribes of Indians, now at peace, but armed, and at any moment ready for war, whose steps toward civilization should be taken under the close supervision of a strong and intelligent government. So Tehran uh, knew that it was a dangerous situation with the Indians, and then he discussed the American immigrants, and this is what he said, quote, Among these foreigners are fugitives from justice, honest laborers, vagabonds and criminals, but honorable and dishonorable alike travel with their political constitution in their pockets, demanding the privileges, authority, and officers which such a constitution guarantees. Close quote. So I thought that was a pretty interesting observation of the Americans of the early 1800s traveling with their constitutions, which is probably a good idea. So always have your pocket constitution handy. Tehran would go on to be uh, commanding general of what was called the Eastern Interior Provinces, which included Coahuila Tejas, and he made several recommendations. And he made these recommendations in 1829 after assessing the situation. And many of them have to do with placing troops and um, military installations, but a few of them are pretty interesting. One of the things uh, that he recommended politically was to settle convicts in Texas, uh, to encourage the immigration of Mexican families to Texas, to encourage the immigration of Swiss and Germans to Texas. Now think about that in the 1820s. That was pretty interesting, especially what we know about how there was a massive influx of German immigrants in the mid 1800s. Tehran encouraged co- what he described as coastwise trade, in other words, using the coast of Texas to enhance trade into Mexico. And one important recommendation was the alteration of Austin's contract to give the government control of the coast leagues. Now, what Austin had achieved by this time was an additional grant of land on the Texas coast. Now, this recommendation obviously relates back to Tehran's desire to use the coast of Texas for trade to benefit Mexico. And by giving Austin control of some of these coast leagues, they would end up in not only in private hands, but in the private hands of these American immigrants with their pocket constitution. So Tehran thought that they ought to take that back. Well, uh, I mentioned Bustamante earlier. Anastasio Bustamante had led a revolution in Mexico and seized control of the Mexican Republic. And he issued a decree. It's called the Bustamante Decree of April 1830 or the uh, April 6, 1830 law or the 1830 law in Texas history. And this law, I'm going to say, started the Texas Revolution or certainly enhanced the revolutionary thinking of the citizens. One of the most important parts of this law is that it prevented any further immigration from the United States. Article 11 of the law reads as follows, quote, in accordance with the right reserved by the General Congress in the seventh article of the law of August 18th, 1824, it is prohibited that immigrants from nations bordering on this republic shall settle in the states or territory adjacent to their own nation. Consequently, all contracts not already completed and not in harmony with this law are suspended, close quote. So, What that said was nobody from the United States, which was the only country bordering uh, Texas, could immigrate to Texas. 
uh, you could immigrate, you could immigrate to Mexico, but you couldn't live in Texas. So that was the key part of the 1830 law that riled everyone up because the idea that you would come over as part of Austin's colony and later send for your family after you were established was out the window. There was another important article that I need to mention, and it was the one immediately preceding that. It was Article 10. Article 10 says, quote, no change shall be made with respect to the slaves now in the states, but the federal government and the government of each state shall most strictly enforce the colonization laws and prevent the further introduction of slaves. Close quote. There's a great book. It's a recent book. It's not brand new, but it's recent by Dr. Andrew Torgett at North Texas State University. It's called Seeds of Empire, and it does a wonderful job of analyzing the importance of the slave economy to the cotton production in Texas and uh, essentially what it describes uh, in a very interesting from a very interesting perspective is the notion that they would transport the southeastern United States plantation system into Texas uh, and of course slavery was key to that system so that also had a remarkable effect on the um, prospects of the Texas settlers so that was very important but it was that Article 11, preventing further immigration from the United States, that truly set everyone off. The other thing that happened after this law of 1830 was that the Mexican government started sending more troops to Texas to try to enforce the law. One of the areas um, that they sent troops to was Anahuac. Anahuac is located just east of Houston in Chambers County, and the uh, person in charge at Anahuac was a man named John Davis Bradburn. Now, Bradburn had fought in the 1821 Mexican Revolution uh, with the revolutionaries. He was appointed to found the town of Anahuac, to locate a town in that area. He chose uh, an area called Perry's Point um, and founded the town of Anahuac. And when I say founded the town, he set up the customs house uh, to enforce the tariffs and duties imposed by that 1830 law. Because all that coastal trade and everything that Tehran had talked about, that was par also part of the 1830 law. Well, there were some disturbances around Anahuac called, appropriately enough, the Anahuac Disturbances, uh, concerning those tariffs. And the f uh, there was actually armed conflict. And uh, during that time, we had the first pseudo-governmental actions from the Texas settlers, and those were called the Turtle Bayou Resolutions. So during the Anahuac disturbances, and uh, once again, i got to promise you a future episode on the Anahuac disturbances, but um, during those disturbances, the, the citizens retreated uh, to a ranch owned by name, a man named White on Turtle Bayou near Anahuac, and they drafted what came to be known as the Turtle Bayou Resolutions in June of 1832. And the resolutions note that Santa Ana was then leading a revolution against Bustamante and the centralist government. See, at that time, Santa Ana was a Federalist, supporting, at least by all appearances, the Constitution of 1824, the Constitution under which the Texas settlers desired to live, uh, the Federalist Constitution. The Turtle Bayou Resolutions uh, make it clear that the colonists are siding with Santa Ana, and they have what are referred to in the resolutions, quote, grievances of such character as to arouse the feelings of every free man and impel him to resistance, close quote. Sounds a little bit like some language in 1776. So they declared their allegiance to the revolutionaries on the side of Santa Ana. They talked about the military uh, being oppressive to the colonists, arresting them, uh, stealing their slaves, imposing martial law, and uh, they declared their support for the, quote, highly and distinguished chieftain Santa Ana, close quote. Boy, would that change. So they united with Santa Ana. Uh, the Anahuac disturbances were actually successfully resolved without out-and-out -out extended fighting. Uh, some Mexican officials from Nacogdoches came down and uh, resolved them, but uh, we'll save a little bit of that detail for another episode. Later, in 1832, the same year, trouble was obviously brewing. Uh, the disturbances at Anahuac had aroused a group of settlers near Velasco to take a cannon 
sail it to Anahuac and participate in the fighting against the Mexican government. Now, what you can tell by these incidents is that there was an itch on the part of the colonists to revolt, at least some of them. Um, the alcalde, which is uh, the mayor, so, sort of, of the Austin's capital, San Felipe de Austin, and the alcalde of Brazoria. Now, these alcaldes were settlers, and they were put in these positions, and the settlers were governing their municipalities under uh, the Mexican law. They called a meeting in San Felipe for October the 1st, 1832. Fifty-six delegates were elected from the various Texas settlements, and they met in San Felipe in what's called the Consultation of 1832 to decide how best to support Santa Ana and oppose the centralist Mexican government. So think about that. One of the first meetings in Revolutionary Texas was designed to figure out how to best support uh, the man who would later attempt to crush the Texans. Stephen F. Austin was, appropriately enough, elected president of the consultation. Uh, the two major settlements in Texas at the time that went back before the, settle- the colonists, La Bahia, or Goliad, and San Antonio de Bejar, were not represented. Now, there was a representative from La Bahia that showed up later after the consultation had done its business, uh, but the residents of San Antonio did not send anyone. And I think that's very interesting because that was, you know, there were Mexican troops in San Antonio. That was essentially the center of all activity in Texas. And uh, su- I suppose they thought it better not to participate in this meeting. Now, the consultation formed several committees, and they were going to address the things in the 1830 law, the import duties, the Article 11, preventing immigration. Uh, the consultation wanted to organize schools. They, very interestingly, wanted to provide for Indian reservations. This is back in 1832, uh, already foreseeing that we were going to have to form some sort of relationship with the Indian tribes of Texas because there were so many. Um, And most importantly, to examine the idea of separate statehood for Texas. Now, this is not independence from Mexico. This is separate statehood for a state of Texas or Tejas to split from the state of Coahuila. There is um, a lot of background to the relations between the provinces of Coahuila in Texas, and there's a lot of um, Mexican legislative background to this. Uh, Former state historian and author Dr. Frank de la Teja has written a book on the relations between Coahuila and Texas from the Mexican perspective, and it's a very interesting study of what all was going on with respect to the statehood of Texas. Well, Austin was aware of all this, and so that was a really big issue political issue at the time. In 1832, I'm sure there were some people advocating for independence, but that was not part of the consultation. They were not talking about uh, independence from Mexico at that time. They were talking about independence from Coahuila. The consultation prepared a memorial to the Mexican government, which is essentially a letter. Uh, It looks a little bit like a declaration. It was dated October 4th, 1832, and it discusses, among other things, the, quote, sacred Republican privilege close quote, of making known their wants and grievances, the wants and grievances of the colonists. Well, that's a very American notion, isn't it, to petition the government for redress. Uh, The 1830 law, uh, they criticized the 1830 law, saying that it implied they were not loyal to Mexico, which they were, uh, according to them. Uh, It talks about how hard it had been to settle land and the fact that it never would have been settled but for the immigrants from the United States, and that's probably right because it never had been settled until then. Uh, The immigrants settle it. Um, They uh, proclaim in this memorial that they deserve some recognition for that and uh, certainly more than implies that it never would have been done but for that immigration. It does mention, and as it had to at that time, the Fredonian Rebellion of 1826, but it totally disavows the participants It calls them, quote, bad and desperate men with a mad design, close quote. Um, They had to explain uh, and disavow those guys because that had really caused a lot of tension with the government. Another part of the memorial uh, criticizes the 1830 law for opening the door to, quote, European parasites of power, close quote, while shutting it to the U.S. immigrants. So uh, the the tone of the document is really, uh, why would you invite... European immigrants who are monarchists 
back into Mexico after Mexico had fought a revolution against that very form of government, why wouldn't you honor the federalism that Mexico instituted under the Constitution of 1824, a federalism that the uh, immigrants from the United States agree with and share in their home country? Uh, so that was the, the tone of that memorial. And they thought after doing that that the uh, fervor in the col- in Texas would subside a little bit and maybe the 1830 law could be amended it also discusses the commercial exploitation of Texas's great resources and how they need the immigrants to do that. And then it says, quote, with General Santa Ana, we united as fellow laborers in the same sacred cause, close quote. They took the memorial to uh, Bejar. The town council of Bejar, called the Ayuntamiento, uh, were actually pretty sympathetic, but they weren't willing to overtly support this uh, meeting of the immigrants. The representative of the government there was uh, the guy in charge politically is called the Jefe Politico. His name was Don Jose de la Garza. And he wrote a letter to Austin and he acknowledged that the measures in the 1830 law were strict and that the military had been a little bit overbearing. Uh, But he also wrote another letter at the same time while he was telling Austin that he generally supported his views, he was telling the governor of Coahuila, Tejas, something different. And that letter wasn't discovered until many years later. Uh, but what he was saying to the Mexican government can be summed up in this quote. Quote, a true Mexican can but bitterly deplore his misfortune and feel sorely the foreign hand that came boldly to rob him of his rights, employing physical force. Close quote. Well, uh, Suffice to say, the Jefe Politico hadn't seen anything yet. Uh, So he was talking out of both sides of his mouth. Um, Another letter was sent to Austin during this time by a prominent politician in San Antonio, and he enclosed a letter that he had sent scolding the Ayuntamiento for sympathizing with the Anglos. And Austin replied to that letter with a letter of his own trying to calm him down uh, because Austin wanted to make clear that revolution was not really what they were seeking. They were trying to redress their grievances. But in that letter, Austin said the following, quote, I give it as my deliberate judgment that Texas is lost if she take no measure of her own for her welfare, uh, close quote. Now, I, I think really what Austin was talking about was that statehood issue, uh, not out-and-out revolution, but a break from the state of Coahuila. But here's the most interesting part. Austin writes, quote, I am settling up all my affairs, and in April I will go to the north for six months or a year, close quote. So Austin was fixing to leave. And you can't help but wonder if one reason he might do that was to let things calm down a little bit uh, if he saw himself as sort of a political leader and being thrust into a role as revolutionary leader, although we'll see in a minute that he ended up in that place anyway. Well, how did the Mexican government respond to the redress of grievances? Utter, total silence. So in 1833, there was another consultation. The delegates convened, another 56 delegates, in April 1833. They felt ignored, or certainly not taken very seriously. They went back to San Felipe. This time, William Wharton uh, chaired the meeting. The feelings for statehood, um, separate statehood from Coahuila, were much stronger, and the word independence was thrown around a little more liberally. Austin wanted to advocate, uh, flat out advocate, for separate statehood for Texas. He did not, however, want Texas to have its own constitution. Now, back then, uh, during this time, under Mexican law, the states could have their own constitution and sort of set up their own government a little bit. Um, Coahuila y Tejas had uh, some independent governmental structures, uh, but Austin just wanted separate statehood. Wharton, William Wharton, the chair of the meeting, wanted not only independence as a Mexican state, but also its own constitution. Now, that's important because you can imagine what the leaders in a an independent state of Tejas, uh, leaders that would include, no doubt, many of the colonists would draft a constitution that would extend uh, or at least solidify the Mexican constitution of 1824 for the central Mexican government, you can imagine that might be a problem and the conflict that would create. We never got a chance to see how that would happen, uh, but I can see that that would be a pretty aggressive move and no doubt would have been taken had Texas become an independent state. Uh, 
the agenda was similar. The agenda of the consultation of 1833 was very similar, uh, a little more strident than the consultation of 1832. Uh, it flat out uh, desired statehood. It asked for a repeal of Article 11 of the 1830 law. Uh, it asked for tariffs that actually encouraged immigration and encouraged commerce. So the the battle lines, so to speak, were drawn on those issues. Um, the chair of the committee to examine a state constitution for an independent state of Texas was our buddy Sam Houston. And uh, that committee did a lot of work on a proposed constitution, which looked um, a lot like the U.S. Constitution, as you might imagine. And this consultation also drafted a memorial or a report to the Mexican government. And in the very first sentence of the memorial, it calls for the independent statehood of Texas to separate from Coahuila. And uh, in what would later prove to be fairly ironic, the memorial uh, defended once again the Mexican in the Indian tribes in this part of Mexico and called out the Mexican government for failing to provide uh, what had been promised to the peaceful tribes of Texas, which was land and essentially reservations, um, which I think is uh, given especially Lamar's policy to the Indians in the early days of the Republic, a fairly ironic thing for 1833. It also went on to ask for other things that the settlers uh, had been demanding for some time. Uh, three people were to deliver this memorial to the Mexican government, James Miller, Stephen F. Austin, and Erasmo Seguin. Uh, but it turns out only Austin could make the trip, so down he went to Mexico. And he found, instead of a stable government ready to receive and discuss the uh, envoy from Texas, uh, he found a problem. Uh, the vice president of Mexico at the time, Valentin Gomez Farias, had taken over as president. But uh, his old ally, Santa Ana, was plotting to take over from him. And Santa Ana's plot was to basically tear up the Constitution of 1824, consolidate power, and institute himself as dictator. And so this is the well-known change in Santa Ana. He went from a Federalist, um, or at least advocating Federalism, I doubt he was ever really a Federalist, uh, to flat out saying he was going to lead a revolution and become the dictator. Well, Austin got a few concessions from Farias on immigration, and he started back for Texas. Now, shortly after he left, though, Farias found out that Austin had been trying to get the people in San Antonio to support Texas statehood, and that was too much for Farias. So he ordered Austin arrested. They caught up to Austin before he could get back to Texas and put him in prison for a year and a half, never charging him with anything and never giving him a trial. Well, that did it for Austin. He was finally released in 1835. He made it back to Texas. Uh, the citizens by this time were essentially in rebellion although they were still fairly disorganized. And Austin, that led to uh, a new consultation of 1835. So in August of 1835 in the town of Columbia, there was a meeting uh, called the Consultation of 1835. There was confusion about what the purpose of that meeting was, but they knew they had to get together. Um, and there was some confusion about whether that meeting had any power to act as a body. Um, but so the meeting, what the delegates did was agree to adjourn the meeting and convene a formal constitu uh, consultation with some power in San Felipe in October 1835. So uh, as you remember or may remember from earlier episodes, uh, there was some military action going on in April 1835. A militia had assembled uh, to march on San Antonio de Bejar. October 2nd, 1835, we had that famous incident where the Mexican troops tried to reclaim the cannon that they had provided to the settlers at Gonzales. The settlers uh, wrote on a piece of cloth, come and take it, and fired uh, the first shots of the Texas Revolution, uh, killing a couple of Mexican soldiers and starting uh, the military part of the Texas Revolution. The Battle of Concepcion occurred in late October. We covered that in an earlier episode and resulted in a resounding Texian victory. Uh, and that those military activities delayed the consultation until November 1st of 1835. And in the meantime, uh, 
uh, from that October time to the November time, there was what was called a permanent council that governed for about three weeks. So the permanency of the council was only three weeks. Uh, interestingly, the notes of that permanent council are preserved, and you can read the proceedings. And it was a fairly organized group. Um, so in preparation for this formal consultation, which purportedly, well, you know, would result in yet another memorial to the Mexican government, we had this council, and the settlers really were organized. And they were discussing financing uh, the revolution. We knew there was going to be a revolution and shots were being fired. So they started acting more and more like a government during this permanent council. And if you read the journal notes of the council, um, there are several discussions of the military situation. They set up a mail service. Uh, they provided for rangers on the frontier. Uh, the last entry uh, of the council notes authorizes a form of a letter of mark authorizing the harassment of Mexican shipping on the seas. And uh, in the meantime, Stephen F. Austin is commanding uh, the army marching on Behar. Now, some of the delegates to this consultation of 1835 uh, wanted to fight for, wanted to be public about fighting for the 1824 Constitution. And they wanted to do that, I think, because it would have been an easier sell to the native population of Texas. Uh, another group just wanted to flat out declare independence and uh, get on with the revolution. Uh, there was a vote held at this consultation on November 7th that called for a provisional government on the principles of the 1824 Constitution. And so this situation was really in flux and a little bit disorganized as to how this government was going to get on with its business. In the meantime, uh, the military situation was involve, evolving. The delegates to the consultation created a governmental structure called the Organic Law, and it called for a governor and an advisory council from the delegates of the various towns. They provided for some other governmental departments. Uh, for the military, they approved both a militia and a regular army, which would result in terrible confusion. And so as organized as they seemed to be, it really was uh, somewhat chaotic. Sam Houston was elected general of the military, but they didn't recruit any army. Uh, so he had really nobody to command. The only people that were actually fighting in Behar were militiamen. And you uh, recall during the Siege of Behar, there was a great quote from one of the from a letter from one of the soldiers that declared that everyone in the army was a captain. Nobody was really taking orders from anybody. Um, so the result of that consultation of 1835, and by the way, sometimes it's referred to as a general council. We had the organic law, and then uh, they elected what came to be known as the provisional government. So we had yet another body. You see why we needed an episode on all this stuff, because there was n new entities coming out, springing up every which way. Uh, the easiest way to think about the consultation of 1835 is just as one big meeting uh, resulting in a provisional government. So we are between November 1835 and we're heading into winter. The provisional government was fairly active. They passed some ta tax laws. They continued working on the mail service. They actually appointed some judges. Now, there weren't any courts at this time, so that didn't do you a lot of good, but they were at least acting like a government, uh, but not much was being accomplished because of the chaos of the military situation. The militia slash army put Behar under siege in December, uh, won that victory at Behar. General Coase was kicked out of Texas and sent to Mexico. This was a huge uh, victory for the Texians, and uh, the provisional government then could set up a little bit of a more regular military. They appointed several military officers. It turns out they couldn't really recruit uh, that many men. But they did one other thing, and this really was what eventually broke this deal up. They voted to support an attack on Matamoros. You'll recall from the Siege of Behar episode, the victory that the Texians won really emboldened everybody. And they weren't satisfied with taking over the biggest city in Texas. They wanted to go ahead and attack the state of Coahuila at Matamoros. Uh, so a Mexican revolutionary named Jose Antonio Mejia came up with this. Uh, he had led a previous attack on Tampico, Mexico, which was a disaster. And uh, we'll talk, we'll give a episode to the Tampico expedition. But suffice to say, he was unsuccessful. Uh, he abandoned his men. Those men were executed. Uh, Henry Smith, who was the provisional governor under this provisional uh, 
Uh, government wasn't terribly excited, but sort of supported the Matamoros expedition. Houston supported the Matt, Sam Houston supported the Matamoros expedition because he thought he'd lead it. Uh, in fact, he sent word to Jim Bowie in Behar to get ready to move. In the meantime, a guy in San Antonio named Dr. James Grant decided he was going to lead the expedition against Matamoros with himself in command, not Houston. So he lobbied uh, the provisional government to let him be the leader. Um, now, Grant, what you need to know about Grant is um, he had extensive land holdings in Coahuila. So an expedition to Matamoros uh, might have been a play to uh, get his land holdings back. Well, uh, Houston had planned to go through Goliad, pick up Fannin's men who were there by this time, and form a superior force and hopefully lure all of Grant's volunteers into his force and head on down to Matamoros. The council, however, went around Houston and they appointed yet other commanders. They appointed a gentleman named Frank Johnson and uh, our friend Colonel James Fannin to lead the Matamoros expedition. So you now have three, uh, well actually four, commanders. And Johnson and Fannin, as among themselves, thought each thought that they were the commander of the expedition. So you can see this was falling apart fast. Henry Smith changed his mind, the provisional governor. Uh, he ordered Houston to be in command. Uh, Johnson had already left San Antonio. Uh, he left behind just a few men under the command of uh, J.C. Neal and took most of the men and almost all of the supplies on this Matamoros expedition. So Neal put his men in the Alamo for their own safety, and we know how that story ended. And this was really the beginning between of the split between uh, Governor Henry Smith and the rest of the, of the council or provisional government or whatever you want to call it, the advisory council. He derided all the council members as traitors for supporting this expedition. He said he was, quote, tired of watching scoundrels abroad and scoundrels at home, close quote. He ordered the council to dissolve. The council rep responded by impeaching him as governor. So um, technically James Robinson became governor at that point, uh, but Smith wouldn't leave the office. Remember that episode about the uh, Davis Co. collection that would happen again in the 1860s when Governor E.J. Davis refused to leave the governor's office. So Smith stayed around acting like the government, the governor, even though the council had impeached him and put somebody else in. So it was utter chaos. Uh, many of the delegates just left and went home. Uh, late in December of 1835, they did manage to officially call for a convention. This time they called it a convention to meet at Washington and La Brazas in 1836. Smith vetoed this call for a convention, but of course they ignored it because they thought they had impeached him. So it was a mess. Um, in February, this governing council moved to Washington on the Brazos and to elect the convention delegates despite Smith's veto, and that occurred in February of 1836. Now, Santa Ana was marching into Texas at this time. We had sieged Behar. The Matamoros expedition eventually fell apart. Part of the part of the group stayed in Refugio or San Patricio. They ended up in another battle. Part of them went back to Goliad. Part of them went back to Behar. Uh, we know about those battles. But let's talk finally about the convention of 1836. On March the 1st, uh, the weather was very cold. They met in Washington on the Brazos in a building that they'd rented, and as far as I can determine from the archives, never paid for. So I think we still owe some money to some descendants for the rent of the building in Washington on the Brazos. And this meeting exhibited, uh, uh, finally, some organization. There were 44 delegates on the first day, and by the end there were 59 delegates. They immediately organized in a more formal way. Uh, they elected Richard Ellis, the chair of the convention. Herbert Kimball served as the secretary. There was a committee appointed to draft a Declaration of Independence, which was adopted on March the 2nd, so they worked pretty fast. Uh, it was very unlikely that the Declaration of Independence, which ended up being about six pages, uh, was drafted in one day. George Childress, who's credited with drafting that document, probably already had one ready to go, uh, especially since they'd been discussing these things for so long. Um, some men were appointed to copy it for distribution because they didn't have a printed a printing press, but the copies were so full of mistakes they had to go back and redo it. So there was a delay in uh, distributing the Declaration of Independence. In the meantime, the convention was receiving dispatches from the Alamo. Now, we're right in the middle of the siege. It's March 2nd, 1836. 
And at breakfast time on March the 6th, 1836, which was a Sunday, Travis's letter of March the 3rd arrived at Washington on the Brazos, and it was read out loud to the convention. Now, this, this is Travis's letter that starts the letter by mentioning the utter discord and disorganization of the government. Uh, he details the military situation and pleads with the government for resupply and reinforcement. Now, by the time that letter was read at breakfast on March 6th, the Alamo had already fallen and all the defenders had been killed. Of course, they didn't know that at the time. Um, well, on when they read the letter on March the 6th, uh, several people started for Behar from Washington on the Brazos to help Travis. Well, the Constitution was being drafted uh, during this point in the convention. It was being drafted along with the Declaration. Uh, the first draft of the Constitution, by all accounts, was just terrible. Um, the accounts of the convention discuss how slowly things were dragging along. It wasn't that they were disorganized. It was just that they felt no sense of urgency. Remember, they still didn't know what had happened at the Alamo. Um, I mentioned earlier one of the most important things that they were discussing was financing this whole revolution, and so there was a ton of discussion about the loan uh, that they were going to go to New Orleans and get to fund all this. Um, one attendee to the, com to the convention wrote the following in a letter, quote, there is a great want of political philosophy and practical political knowledge in the body, close quote. So you can see that even though it was more organized than any of the prior meetings, even the convention of 1836 wasn't getting a lot of stuff done in a timely manner. Well, on March 15th, the convention received two letters from Sam Houston detailing the fall of the Alamo. Well, things became urgent, and that fired up the convention to get to work. They finished the Constitution in a matter of hours, and on 12 noon, March 16th, um, the Constitution was finished and distributed and uh, adopted, and the following day, March 17th, the convention adjourned. And one attendee describes the scene as they adjourned, quote, the members are dispersing in all directions with haste and in confusion. A general panic seems to have seized them, close quote. So what had happened was they realized that Santa Ana was not only, uh, that Santa Ana had a huge army and he was in no mood to mess around with this revolution, having killed everyone at the Alamo. So they were uh, hooking it out of there as fast as they could. Um, one writer who was in Washington for the convention described what we now know as the runaway scrape as families and people began to stream through Washington with everything uh, that they could carry. Uh, the government decided uh, that they were going to flee to Harrisburg, um, and so the convention was over. But Texas had declared independence as a result of this convention. We had adopted a constitution, and we had what came to be known as the ad interim government. And the government was as follows. David Burnett was the president. Lorenzo de Zavala was the vice president. Samuel Carson was Secretary of State. Bailey Hardiman was Secretary of the Treasury. Thomas Rusk was Secretary of War. Robert Potter was Secretary of the Navy. And David Thomas was the Attorney General. The first act of the ad interim government was to get the heck out of Washington on the Brazos and out of the way of the Mexican Army. But in a little over a month, it would all be resolved on the plains of San Jacinto. So you can see that uh, during revolutionary Texas, uh, it was very difficult for the citizens to organize because everybody had different ideas of uh, the results to be achieved. That all eventually came together uh, between Stephen F. Austin's imprisonment, the oppression of the Mexican military in Texas, the desire for the freedoms of at least the Constitution of 1824 and, and soon probably a Constitution that would look more like the United States Constitution, it just built up to a boiling point where revolution became inevitable, and so it was. Well, we now come to the part of the show called Getting There, where I tell you how to go see some of the places we mentioned in the episode. Uh, the Turtle Bayou Resolutions, there's a historical marker near where they were signed, and I'm going to give you the address. It's 228 White Park Road in Anahuac, Texas. Look that up on your map, and uh, if you go out I-10 East from Houston and turn south on Highway 61, uh, it'll be to the right in White Park, and that's where the Turtle Bayou Resolutions were signed. Uh, 
uh, while you're there. I always uh, advocate going into Anahuac, seeing some of the history there. There's just a tremendous amount of uh, Texas history occurred there, including the disturbances that we talked about earlier. Uh, San Felipe de Austin, the capital of Austin's colony and the scene of several of the consultations, is located on the Brazos River just north of I-10 and just east of Sealy, Texas. If you get on I-10 uh, from either direction, exit Farm Road 1458. That's Farm Road 1458 north. And a few miles up that road, you will find the San Felipe State Historical Site. And they're doing a ton of work out there. It looks fantastic. You can stand uh, right where these gentlemen met in consultation. And there's a website, and it is www.colonialcapitalofTexas.com. ColonialcapitalofTexas.com. And they've always got something going on out at the San Felipe State Historical uh, Site. It's a very interesting place. And finally, Washington on the Brazos State Park, the site of the Convention of 1836. It is between Brenham and Navasota, Texas, off of State Highway 105. Uh, it also has a website, and the website is www.wheretexasbecametexas.org, wheretexasbecametexas.org. And they always have a lot of events at Washington on the Brazos. And one I want to mention in particular, on March the 5th, the Texas Independence Day celebration, and the keynote speaker for the Texas Independence Day celebration will be your humble host of Wise About Texas. So I'll be giving a talk on the spirit of Texas and Texas independence. I'm recording this in 2017, so March 5th, 2017. Come on out to Washington on the Brazos, and we'll get involved in some Texas history. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you very much for listening. Do me a favor. Share this show with a friend. That's the best way to get more people involved in the preservation and promotion of Texas history. Please like and share our Facebook page, Wise About Texas. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Wise About Texas. And take a minute, if you think this show's worth a dollar or two, to go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, slash Wise About Texas, and make a pledge towards supporting this show and the promotion and preservation of Texas history. Thanks a lot for listening today. Go out and do something for the great state of Texas. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.